But Jesus didn't only come to forgive us of our sins. He came to be Lord over our life. Lord over every situation, every problem, every circumstance. And if you didn't know, Lord or Lordship means the master or ruler. Jesus came to be master or ruler of our life, but he won't force himself into our situation and needs. We've got to invite him in. But what do you mean, pastor? If I prayed the prayer of salvation, that's all I need. That's the first step. You've received Christ, but now he wants you to walk in that. We still have to continue every day to say, Jesus, I want you to come into this situation. I want you to be a part of my life. I want you to lead me. I'm surrendering to you today, your lordship. That's why Jesus said you have to die to yourself and your flesh and pick up your cross and follow after him daily. That's what that means. You've got to invite him in to be lord over your life every single day. That's why Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, he said, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. And so Jesus is knocking on the door of people's hearts today that don't know him. Even before we knew him, he was knocking on the door of our heart to let him in. Because he's the truth, the life, and the way. He's the only answer. He's the only solution to our sin problem. And he wanted to give us a brand new life. And sometimes as believers, we invite Jesus in to forgive our sin, but we don't include him in every area of our life. It's almost as if We've invited him in to share a meal with him, and then when we're done, we walk him out the front door until we need him again. But the reality is, is that every day we wake up, every time we pray, we need to invite Jesus into our need and our situation, whether it's our own or it's someone else's. And we need to invite Jesus in faith, knowing that he wants to reveal his glory in our life and in others' life and situation, just as he did at the wedding at Cana. What would it look like in our life or our lives and situations that we're praying for if we invited Jesus in every time? We're not gonna just assume assume that he's gonna take care of it, but we literally, physically, spiritually say, Jesus, I invite you into my day. I invite you into this need. Have your way. You're the same God. Come on, somebody. You're the same God yesterday, today, and forever. You don't change. So, God, I'm inviting you into my life. I'm inviting you into my marriage because we need some help in our marriage. I'm inviting you into my kids' lives and their situations. I'm inviting you into this person's need. Lord, have your way. When we invite Jesus, he always shows up. Jesus never turns down an invitation. So we need to include him. A question I want to ask you, how many opportunities have we missed to see a miracle or answer because we possibly didn't live or pray in faith by inviting Jesus in? Only the Lord knows. But when invited, Jesus shows up. The second thing is this, that we see in this miracle, is that tell Jesus what you need. Notice verse 3 that says, when they ran out of wine, Mary, Jesus' mother, tells him of the need. She knew that it would be an embarrassment for the bridegroom and the wedding party and family. And so Mary, knowing her son is God in flesh, told Jesus of the need, expecting him to do something about it in a miraculous way. And Paul reminds us to tell God what we need in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, what? Present your requests to God. We know also from Scripture in Matthew 6 that Jesus gives us the model to pray, where our Heavenly Father wants us to approach Him in faith when we pray without anxiousness, as Paul says in Philippians 4, 6, but also with a thankful heart. And when we 
come to God in that way when we approach our Heavenly Father. We tell God our need knowing in faith that he's going to answer our need in his timing, in his way. But we must include Jesus in every situation. Third, when we pray and listen for God's voice, do whatever he tells you to do. First, Jesus addresses his mother here as woman, and he's not addressing her in a rude or a dis disrespectful way or tone, but he's responding abruptly to remind her that ultimately he came as an obedient son to do the Father's will. He's reminded her that the Father comes first, not just what she wanted, but what he wants. And his time to be known as the Messiah and eventually die had not come yet. But then we see that Mary went on to tell the servants. She says, do whatever he tells you to do. I did my part. I spoke up. I know who he is, is what she's thinking to herself. Just do whatever he tells you to do. In other words, there are times when God may tell us to do something unconventional that doesn't make sense to us. And we may question what God told us, not understanding why, but we need to be obedient even when we don't understand it. That's why it's called a step of faith. That's why it's called a walk of faith. Every single day with the Lord, we're trusting him. There's some things we get. There's some things he, he, he reveals to us and we're discerning and we see why he's doing what he's doing. And there's other times he will tell us to do something that we don't understand why or it doesn't make sense to us. But we just need to do whatever he tells us to do which means that we've not only got to be in the word, but we've got to listen for his voice, his still small voice, because he will speak to us and impress upon our hearts and minds what he wants us to do. And then we've got to be obedient. And the reason is, is that even in those times of needs that we have, or we need a miracle, if God's telling us to do something unconventional, we've got to respond and be obedient because our miracle comes through our obedience to do what God has told us to do. We see that in the, even in the different miracles that Jesus performed, telling them one man to go wash in the water. Well, what's that going to do? You could have just told me I'm healed. Or spitting in a man's eyes because he was blind. Rubbing some mud on him. God does some un unconventional things at times. And you know why I've come to find out and learn in my life is that because too many times as believers... We think we know it all. And we put God in a box. And God's like, you can't put me in a box. I don't live in your time. I don't live in a box. I do things in an unconventional way at times. And so we've got to respond and be obedient. That's why Jesus told us he's the vine and we're the branches. In John chapter 15, 14 through 17, it says... You are my friends if you do what I command. In other words, obedience to Jesus. Verse 15 says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. In other words, reveal his glory. Fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. And so Jesus reveals his glory through us as we remain in him and bear fruit. Come on, somebody. At the wedding in Cana, Jesus used stone jars for ceremonial washing to turn water into wine. Symbolically, Jesus came to be the ultimate purifier when he would give his life on the cross one day for our sin. That's what he was communing. It was a symbolic miracle of who he is. It was a foreshadowing of not only who he is, but what he came to do. And so when the Lord tells us to do something in our lives, we must be obedient, even if it seems unconventional to us, because we bear fruit to reveal his glory in us and through us, as we live in faith and pray in faith. Here's the fourth thing that we see out of this passage is that God saves the best for last. 
God saves the best for last. As we see in the story, typically best wine was served first at weddings. And here Jesus saves the best for last in turning the water into wine, revealing that he's the all-providing bridegroom. Just think about that a little bit. He's showing his love even today to our lives in every single way. He reveals his love because God promises to meet every one of our needs. And God never goes part way in meeting our need. If you look back in your life when you've seen God answer a need, he never goes part way. He doesn't finish part of it, he completes it. Sometimes it's in ways that we're expecting him and he does exactly that. Sometimes it's in unconventional ways. Sometimes it's in ways that he provides a miracle that we never thought of, but our need is met. And don't forget that God's always on time. He's never late. He's always providing his best in his timing. That's why we never stop praying. That's why we never stop living in faith as as we get and receive God's best because he saves his best for last. And so I want to encourage you, always go to the Lord first in every situation. But when it comes to a physical need and when the doctors can do no more, Jesus steps in and does the impossible because with him, Nothing is impossible. Just when we don't know what to do financially, God steps in out of nowhere to provide resources for our needs. And I've seen that in our lives at times. We're out of nowhere God provides and meets the need. In fact, Heather Neighbors this past Sunday shared with me that leading up to that Sunday that they had a financial need and out of nowhere, God miraculously stepped into her situation and provided a financial miracle. That's who God is. Even when we read in scripture about heaven and eternal life, God is saving the best for last. Eternal life is our reward because of our faith and belief in Jesus. God's saving his best as the grand finale to be enjoyed for all of eternity. That's why we always go back to Hebrews eleven six, 6, where it says, and without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Church, faith truly is the non-negotiable to living a life that pleases God and receiving the reward when we earnestly seek him. Heaven is our ultimate reward for a life of earnest living for God and seeking him. So we've got to invite Jesus into every situation. We got to tell him of the need. We got to do whatever he tells us to do. And we got to watch in faith as God saves the best for last in our lives and situations and as well as in others' lives when he reveals his glory through us to them. Because that's who God is. He's always wanting to reveal who he is, to reveal his glory. In Luke 17, Jesus told his disciples that there are many things that cause people to stumble in their faith. But he says, woe to those who cause them to stumble. And so then Jesus went on to tell them to forgive anyone who sins against them. And here's the apostles' response in Luke 17, verse 5. And then also reading verse 6, it says, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And Jesus replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. And so the disciples thought that they needed more faith to help them forgive those who had sinned against them. But Jesus actually clarified to them that they actually needed pure or authentic faith. A genuine faith. Yes, their their faith needed to grow, but needed to have a genuineness to it. And so I want to give you some ways this morning that we need to grow in our faith so that we live and pray with authenticity. Our heart should be to say, Lord, increase our faith because we do need to grow in our faith, but it has to be pure. It has to be genuine. It has to be authentic without doubt, as the Bible tells us. And so to live a life of authentic faith, the first thing is we need to think faith. We have to get rid of any and all negative thinking within our minds. 
Come on, somebody. We are all in that place. Negative thinking kills faith and displeases God. Yes, when we accept the Christ, he forgives us of our sin, but now we've got to walk it out. And that includes surrendering our mind to make Jesus Lord over every thought and every mind uh, thought that we have every single day. You need to fill your mind with thoughts of praise and assurance. That's why praising God, the enemy has to flee. That's why our, our thoughts begin to focus on the Lord, on his presence, on his goodness. Philippians 4, 8 tells us, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Focusing on the goodness of God and his word changes our actions. The battle always starts here before we act on it. So what are you thinking about? Are you thinking faith-filled thoughts? Or are you thinking doubt-filled thoughts? Are they positive or are they negative? Because the Bible tells us to only focus on the positive, on what's true, and everything else in that verse that we just read. Second thing is, we've got to hear faith. There is so much doubt in the words and the atmosphere around us that doesn't help us to grow in our faith, but it works or can work against us. I would say, and this is a, a, an argument or conversation that we could have, is that it feels like it's, it's almost greater, it's intensified. Because we have access to social media that the world never had until it was created, there is so much negativity out there. There's so much doubt out there. The media and reports, a lot of times they report negative things most of the time. And so we've got to guard ourselves from the negativity. And even when we hear something negative from somebody else or if we're in a conversation with them, or maybe it's a family member or friend and with our family or friend, we need to encourage them like, hey, you know, that's negative. I'm not gonna think that way. I encourage you not to think that way. If it's somebody else we don't know and we hear that negative thought, we take that thought captive. And we say, God, I'm not giving in to that thought I'm not giving in to that negativity. I'm not giving in to that because that's of the enemy and he wants to take me down a path that I don't need to go. Maybe it's we need to turn something off that we're listening to if it becomes negative. You know the old saying, garbage in, garbage out? That's the reality of our thoughts. If it's negative, then at some point we will begin to act on it if we're continually taking in the negative thoughts and the negativity around us. And that we're also supposed to be light and truth through the world around us. It doesn't mean we run and hide our head in the sand. It just means that we acknowledge what's out there, but we're not gonna give in to that. So we're doing the things that we need to do. We need to hear faith. Also why we need to know God's word and hide it in our hearts and minds in those moments. Jesus said in John 5, 24, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him, believes the Father who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. And so hearing God's word and commands and believing through obedience to God brings eternal life to us. Paul says in Romans 10, 17, consequently, faith comes from what? Hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. We listen again to many voices. It could be media relaying mostly bad news. It could be voices of criticism and doubts. But you gotta understand, faith increases and grows when we listen to the good, the pure, and the positive. So listen to the voice of God as he speaks when we become quiet and receptive to him. That's key. And so when we hear God's word, when we hear the truth of who Christ is, our faith grows. If you want to grow in your faith, be in the word. Listen to the word. 
That's why I hope you come on Sundays so that you hear the truth of God's word and you walk out of here changed, encouraged to know that I can conquer life out there for the next six days until we come back here. Grow in your faith. Be intentional in what and who you listen to. The third thing is we got to see faith. Along with hearing faith, we must see with eyes of faith, as it says in Hebrews 12, 2, where it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Today, many have their eyes on temporal things in the world, which drains our faith. It will drain your faith. But when we keep our eyes on Jesus, our faith is strong and it grows. That's why we must concern ourselves as believers with keeping Jesus number one in our heart and life and also focus on winning the lost because our faith will grow. The fourth thing is you got to speak faith. Our tongue has the power of life or death in it, according to Proverbs 18, 21. Depending on how we speak, we can either produce faith or doubt. And here I've listed for you Psalm 105, verse 2. It says, sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of his wonderful acts. Church, when we focus on the Lord and begin to praise his name, declaring his goodness, he not only ministers to us personally, but our faith grows in the Lord. That's why if you're having a rough day, you get some bad news, don't begin to sulk. Don't allow the enemy to beat you up and say, I told you so. Where's your God now? Because he will try to lie to us. He'll try to back us into a corner. And we've got to stand that moment to say, I serve the one true God. And he's revealed himself through his son, Jesus. And I'm an overcomer through him. And so I take every thought captive. I take every lie captive. That's a lie. My God is for me. I did, I'm going to begin to declare who my God is from what I see in Scripture. He's good. He's faithful. Yes. He's promised to meet every single need in my life and every situation that I go through. I'm not going to doubt. I'm not going to worry. So, Lord, I give it to you. I begin to sing your praises. And I promise you, I guarantee you, when we begin to live like that, if we're not living like that already, God reveals him glory, his glory to us. His presence and power will fill the room right where we're at, and we will sense the glory of the Lord in a powerful way so that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God's got this. We've got to speak faith. Speak faith. The fifth thing is we've got to work your faith. Every one of us has to work our faith. Again, faith is not just beliefs, but it's action based on our belief. James 2, 18 says, but someone will, someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds or actions. Show me your faith without actions or deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Active faith is effective faith. Our faith grows as we exercise it, just like a muscle when we go to the gym. It doesn't grow until we exercise it and we begin to put it to work. It's the same when it comes to our faith. As we work our faith, our faith begins to work for us. Come on. Somebody needs to hear this, that as we work our faith, in those moments when it seems like you're having a bad day or bad news comes or you're walking through that trial, you don't have to worry about if you're going to doubt anymore because you've already worked your faith. You've grown your faith to the place where your faith kicks in. And you're like, I know who my God is. I'm not going to give in to fear or to worry or to anxiousness or doubt because I know who I serve. And he's watching over me. He's looking out after me. He's going to take care of this. He's going to meet my need in every single situation. We've got to work our faith to grow it. Understand at the same time, Jesus condemned the Pharisees in Matthew 23, verse 3, because they didn't practice what they preached. They didn't live in faith. 
they weren't obedient to what God had called them to. And so they didn't have faith in who he was. We've got to work our faith. And the last but not least is we've got to walk by faith. Our relationship with Jesus is a daily walk of faith with him. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, that for we live by faith, not by sight. Walk by faith in our daily routine of work and play. Meaning every day when I get up, it's Lord, I'm living by faith today. I'm inviting you in, Jesus. You've already laid out my day. You already know what's ahead. It may be good, it may be not so good, it may be ugly. But today, Lord, you have already got this in control. So I'm walking by faith to know that you've got this day ahead of me or you've got this week ahead, you've got this situation under control, Lord. Even just the, the routine of work and play, our normal daily routine that we're gonna walk by faith. We also walk by faith in our trials and our problems. When things don't look good, when the enemy wants to creep in, when doubt wants to come in and overtake us or overwhelm us, we live by faith and walk by faith. When everything is good and, and at, at all times, whether it's good or bad, we walk by faith. Because walking by faith grows our faith and it pleases God. As we close, I wanna encourage you one last time, church, that living a life of faith is a non-negotiable in order to please God. And when we walk by faith and we seek God earnestly, God promises and he will fulfill that promise to reward us because that's who he is. You can count on him. You can trust in him. We know what's coming in the end. The ultimate reward is heaven, eternal life with Jesus forever. But we can also count on God and his promises because he meets all of our needs. And we will see his goodness and his blessing in our life and in the lives of others as he reveals his glory to us and through us. Amen? Amen. Yeah, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. He is so good and so faithful.